name is Elizabeth Oldfield, and this is a podcast about deep values, the people that hold them, and how those people with those values might be shaping our common life. Every episode, I speak to someone who has some kind of public voice or profile, and I try and get a sense of what drives them. Underneath the hustle and bustle and activity and achievement, what is the vision of the good? What are the values or the ethics that are informing their life? And I want to hear from them what they've learned about engaging across our differences, particularly where we might have differences in exactly those deep values. Guests come from all points on the political compass. Uh, I think spectrum is an unhelpfully binary uh, understanding as we're here with, with today's guests on the political compass from a wide range of religious and non-religious beliefs and philosophies and from all kinds of professions. And I want in this podcast to be popping the bonnet a bit on how those involved in public conversations which so shape our common life, which shape our ability to understand each other and to live together well. What's driving them and how do they think about their role? In this episode, I spoke to Patrick Deneen, who is a professor of political science at the University of Notre Dame. He's a political theorist, essentially. And he became very well known in the States uh, because of his book, Why Liberalism Failed, which was recommended by, among others, Barack Obama. His newest book is called Regime Change Towards a Post-Liberal Future. And we spoke about his childhood, his childhood in a small and rooted community and how that shaped him. We spoke about his Catholicism and we spoke about this, really tried to get a handle on this slightly difficult or fuzzy concept of post-liberalism. What is the kind of um, political vision that he has for how we should be living uh, after, as he thinks, liberalism has failed us? There are some reflections from me at the end as I chew over uh, the thoughts that the conversation has brought up for me. Uh, But meanwhile, I really hope you enjoy listening. Patrick, we are going to go in at the deep end with a question that you don't normally get asked first thing in the morning for you, which is about what is sacred to you? And guests can really take that and run with it in whatever direction that they want. I try and ask them to bracket out things like family members, which I think are probably sacred to all of us. Um, But I'm trying to get at someone's deep values. What bubbled up for you? Yeah, I found this to be, in some ways, both a um, simple and also a difficult question. Um, because for me, the, the sacred is probably fairly traditional. Um, it's God. It's um, the Savior uh, that uh, Christians believe in, Jesus Christ, who is God. Uh, and it's the, it's the, um, it's, you know, the divine, uh, the transcendent. Um, but on in another level, thinking about how, what we might talk about, um, what I really began thinking about was the the Trinity as the kind of essence of what's sacred to me. And I think that opens up a lot of different areas that we can discuss uh, that, that touch on things I've written, touch on things I think a lot about and teach a lot about. Um, so it's really um, God as relationship um, and as sort of um, being, existence, the, the, the universe, the created order as relationship. Uh, so it's mm-hmm. not God apart. It's not God. Um, it's not really God um, as a sort of singular apart, an entity apart. It's God as um, himself, herself, itself um, as relational uh, and as a kind of a kind of ultimate um, model in some ways. Um, the the essence of of our own of our, of our own relationality as human beings. So that that for me would be the the way in which I would sort of propose thinking about um, sacred. And I, and I say that as someone who's a political philosopher, not a theologian. So um, anyone who's listening or watching that wants to, you know, start to pick apart my understanding and knowledge of the Trinity, I'll just fall back on what Sister Carmelita taught me in fourth grade, which is that it's a mystery. Uh, but nevertheless, yeah, I one mean- that I, I believe in. Yes, I, I think anyone who thinks that they have a watertight conception of the Trinity uh, needs to, to to take care. Um, do you, looking back over your life, 
Can you remember Forks in the Road or um, moments where that sacred value, that idea of kind of human beings as inherently and deeply relational because we're made in the image of a relational God has shaped your life or your decisions? It's really hard because these things get so kind of substratum under our lives. I want to see if, if anything surfaces for you as where that value has led you really and guided you. Hmm. Well, I, you know, that's, that's a difficult one to sort of just sort of distill into a moment or a few moments. Um, but I suppose... One one area would be when I came to a kind of dawning realization of what I what I deeply valued about my upbringing. Um, I, this is a you know they say there are two kinds of people in the world: people who think there are two kinds of people in the world, and people who know better. Uh, and yet, uh, I'm going to suggest there are kind of two kinds of people in the world uh, beyond that, which is um, people who tend to have really loved or at least deeply valued and feel deep gratitude to where and with whom they were raised and grew up with, and people who are attempting to escape from that. Uh, and I, and I, I think, obviously, it's, a, it's, a, it's complex, uh, but I think there's a kind of uh, a little bit of a meter in which one tends a little bit more to one side or another side, or maybe one tends a lot to one side or the other side. And I tend to fall a lot on the side of really deeply valuing my upbringing. I grew up in a, in a pretty small town in uh, outside of Hartford, Connecticut, in New England, uh, in a what was actually the oldest town in Connecticut. So it was a very, you know, it was a colonial town. It was laid out um, as a town to be walked in. We um, had the great fortune of living just a few blocks from the downtown. So I didn't have to have an automobile uh, until I went, was in graduate school. So I, I just didn't grow up driving that much, really walking to school, walking to most places. Uh, and I grew up in a, in a neighborhood with a lot of front porches so that a lot of kind of the nicer weather in New England, which is not a long part of the year, lengthy part of the year, uh, but a lot of it would be spent sitting on the porch reading books or hanging out with friends and it was when I went to college and I read, among other things, I read Alexis de Tocqueville, Democracy in America, who has lovely things and very praiseworthy things to say about New England in particular, that I actually learned that what I had valued about growing up and all of the friendships and my family and so forth, that there was a kind of philosophy behind this, that there was a philosophy of, you know, broadly of relationality, but of seeing ourselves as... Um, primarily as embedded creatures, creatures who are embedded in um, contexts and histories and traditions and, um, yeah, a kind of deep web of relationships that expand from the home outward. And and I recognize that, that this philosophy was a kind of competitor to a dominant philosophy that exists in the world that I've written obviously a lot about in my previous book and in the current uh, book about, about to be released, uh, but uh, especially in the book, Why Liberalism Failed. So it's something I've been thinking a lot about, and it, oddly enough, it was kind of a philosophical realization that what I valued actually could be in some ways conceptualized. Mm. And uh, uh, that was kind of a, an interesting realization to me. Yes. Yeah, it's a beautiful picture of a, a human scale community where it was possible to be known and to know people, you know, to know your neighbors and to have enough civic scaffolding that people's lives were brushing up against each other regularly um, across classes and across religions. And that obviously will come to be, um, to show up in your political philosophy. I wanted to just say something that connects to Yoram Hazoni, who I had on the podcast, I think last series in the two types of people mode, he talks about um, loyalists as the people who feel a deep sense of loyalty to their parents. And I am, I'm always intrigued by kind of temperaments and personality types and instinctive tolerance for change, instinctive resistance for change, and how they map so interestingly onto political tribes. And also I think onto theological tribes, you know, you will find many more extroverts in the charismatic evangelical church than you will in the 
liberal Catholic church, for example. Um, so mm. it's helpful for me to, to, to hear their kind of loyalism, um, although you might not call it that, coming through. Could you say a bit more about your childhood and particularly any big ideas, political ideas or religious ideas that were in the air? I guess, I mean, a couple of things. So I, I was raised Catholic. I mean, I think it's interesting to me now um, how many of my friends in the Catholic world are converts to the faith. Uh, and so there was a big wave, especially in the intellectual world, of Catholic converts that occurred in the papacy of John Paul II and Benedict XVI. Um, I'm one of those rare folks, I think, that was raised Catholic and have, and, and have remained Catholic, uh, which... Um, especially in the uh, those who are in the more intellectual realm, I think it's a fairly, I don't want to say it's rare, um, but I tend to run more into converts in the intellectual world than I do um, cradle Catholics. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that has something to do with uh, the, the formation of Catholics in the 1970s, um, you know, problems of catechesis, but also just changes in the broader culture. Uh, this has something to do with what I was just saying about escaping from one's uh, home and one's um, upbringing. Uh, I, there was a, it was a period of time, especially in, in America, in which, uh, especially my, toward the end of my father and mother's generation um, and my generation in particular, uh, there was a, a sense of, be, of finally being free of the Catholic, the Catholic ghetto, <laughs> as uh, as it's known in the U.S. Uh, the kind of the enclaves that Catholics had created for themselves um, in what was a, a hostile Protestant, dominantly hostile, dominantly Protestant culture and civilization in the U.S. And so that they had built a kind of parallel culture that sometimes is now called the Catholic ghetto. You know, it was the schools, it was the all the organizations, the Catholic youth organizations, the Knights of Columbus, you know, kind of a rich, a rich um, field of um, organizations and relationality again, but um, fairly limited uh, in terms of how people experienced the broader country. Uh, mm -hmm. People sort of kept to their own tribe, I guess, to use yeah. the language of Yoram. Uh, and um, that's not that's not really the Catholic way. I would say the Catholic way is to be is to want to be more in the world. Um, I think generally. So when given the opportunity to escape, the the form of escape that took place was kind of to to abandon abandon the faith, uh, sadly, uh, or to minimize the faith, or to make the faith compatible with the broader the broader world. And so I think of the people that I grew up with who were also Catholic, very few of them have remained in the church. Um, and I would attribute my own having remained in the church um, as really as a consequence of that intellectual formation. So not unlike converts, I discovered aspects of the faith in an, in, in an intellectual way that was al almost altogether unknown to me uh, mm -hmm. as someone growing up in the uh, late 60s and early 70s. Yeah. So that that was a that was a major formative aspect. The other one, <clears throat> uh, just very briefly, is that I I was um, twelve years old uh, in 1976. And not to trigger uh, over those of you in the UK, but 1976 was the 200th um, the the bicentennial, the 200th anniversary of the US. Um, I don't know what you would call it the the the, the rebellion. Um, we call it the U.S. Revolution, the Revolutionary War, uh, the Declaration of Independence. And um, it will surprise some readers who know that I'm critical of, of aspects of the founding, uh, that I was a really ardent uh, bicentennial celebrator. Um, I actually learned how to sign, uh, to, to mimic the signatures of all of the signers of the Declaration of Independence so that That's I could, I can probably cute. still today, I can probably still today, I can certainly recreate John Hancock's, which is very distinctive. Uh, but I, I was very into the, the bicentennial. And, uh, um, and I think these, these two points are maybe important because as I matured and as my thinking about these two aspects of my kind of the, the mix of these things, I, 
I began thinking that there was, in some ways, more tension between these two commitments than I had initially realized. Uh, and in some ways, the more the more I entered into this deeper intellectual um, form and understanding of my faith, the more a kind of simple or um, potentially jingoistic American patriotism was called into question uh, by aspects of my faith. Mm -hmm. uh, and in, in particular, what I was just describing, which is the, the way in which Catholics um, broadly learn to conform themselves to the dominant Protestant culture. And I think this is true of both of the kind of dominant tribes of Catholics, the kind of progressive Catholics of the Joe Biden, um, Nancy Pelosi variety, and the more conservative Catholics uh, who have also fit themselves into the dominant American um, broadly Protestant belief system, especially by adopting kind of free market orthodoxies and mantras. So in some ways, um, I had to, you know, my one part of my formation as a young person eventually came into some degree of interesting dialogue and potentially tension with another part of my upbringing. Yeah. I want to come back to that because one of the things about your book that really stood out to me is how gently critical you are of nationalism or a kind of chauvinistic nationalism, a kind of transcendent American identity in ways that I think might surprise quite a lot of people. But I'll just, I want to pick up one more thread from your childhood, which is, were your parents political? Did you talk about party politics? Did you know which way they voted? Not, not really much at all. Um, I think probably it's surprising, again, as someone who went into political science and the study of politics, it seems like most of my colleagues grew up in very highly political households in which the discussion of politics was pretty dominant. And it was sort of seen as unseemly to talk about who you voted for uh, or to talk much about politics. I did, though, have the strong sense that... Um, so I guess around that time, from 76 onward... Um, and I hope I don't embarrass my father at all, but I, I, I sense that he was moving in a more, I guess you would describe it as a conservative direction, um, which tracked, it tracked, again, his generation, um, the move, what came to be known as Reagan Democrats. Hmm. So those people that had grown up, Irish Catholic, which, you know, that was our tribe, my father's tribe especially, um, and who, for whom the Democratic Party was, you know, close to being, you know, as close to being a, just a good Catholic as, as imaginable. And mm -hmm. then in the 1970s and into the, well, starting in the late 60s into the 70s, the move of many kind of working class traditional um, Irish Catholic or Catholic Democrats increasingly into the Republican fold. So I, I, I think that that's part of what was the backdrop, but it was, it was, wasn't, strongly articulated. It was just a sense that one of the identifiers, kind of the the sort of not explicit, but just kind of underlying identifiers of the um, of the Irish Catholic tradition was becoming a little bit more muddied. But mm -hmm. otherwise, it was really not a terribly political household. Yeah, I think that's one of the things that people struggle to understand about the way religion can intersect with politics. Because we're very used to now of these sort of hermetically sealed con containers of left and right and this kind of ethics bum bundling of um, issues. And what Catholic social thought, this incredible intellectual tradition does, is really mess with all the categories. And you get, you know, pro-union, pro-worker, pro-immigrant, teach the direct teaching and, you know, pro-family, social conservatism. Uh, and, it, and, and that... that is a, as a coherent set of ideas that if you're not familiar with it can sound very strange. Uh, but we're going to unpack that a little bit. First, I want to hear about what 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 kind of set you on the road to an academic political philosopher. What was the thread that you were pulling on? Maybe what was that 12-year-old adorable nerd interested in when he was practicing those snitches? I don't know how adorable it was, but it was certainly a nerd. Uh well, I, I had uh, I had zero plans or even conception that I would that I would have an academic career when I entered college. I was um, I was a voracious reader. I always was a voracious reader. Um, I was a bit of a nerd in that sense. Um, and as as I moved into my um, 
senior year, junior, senior year of high school, um, I became very interested in sort of philosophical texts. It, it will shock you to learn this after everything I've said, but I became quite interested in the novels of Ayn Rand, the ultimate, uh, you know, kind of... Uh, individualistic Nietzschean, but that's it's that's not an. I think unusual. that's a teenage boy thing. It, I right? think so. It is, yeah. And if you don't out, if you don't outgrow it, that's uh, that's a real sign. That's of a something. worry. Um, but uh, no, but it's. Uh, I think it is something that young, maybe somewhat ambitious teenage boys, uh, maybe some teenage girls, they're drawn to, um, you know, because it's about being unique and great and distinctive and appeals to that that mm. those set of qualities um, but, but I was it was interesting that, that uh, Ayn Rand was often critical of Plato and Aristotle and she would write how she had read them and concluded that they were all all wrong and I thought well if if, uh, if Ayn Rand thinks they're important enough to read and think they're wrong I better do that too so I started reading Plato and Aristotle as a senior in high school just to get Ayn Rand's understanding of them and I became quite Intrigued by them, and ultimately thought, I think they're, I think they're actually right, uh, or more right about things than than Ayn Rand. So I, 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 I credit Ayn Rand with getting me interested in some of the great uh, classical philosophers. Uh, and when I went to college, I was in a um, introductory class, and I, in in one of my papers, I'm mentioning some works by Plato. And the professor in the class afterwards um, asked, you know, asked, you know, announced my name in class and said, "Could I speak with Patrick Tadeen? I see here in the class it was a big class. So I thought I'd done something wrong, and I I spoke to him after the class, and it turned out he was um, uh, he was a political scientist, political philosopher, um, and he was the first one uh, that uh, introduced me to. Uh, the thought of Alexis de Tocqueville, among others, uh, began a kind of intellectual journey as an academic. Um, I was an English major as an undergraduate, but I took every class that this gentleman taught. His name was Wilson Carey McWilliams, uh, was his name. Uh, and um, he, uh, I think around sophomore year, I said that I was thinking about going to law school. And he looked at me quizzically and said, you're not going to law school, you're going to graduate school. And I said, what's that? What's graduate school? I had no idea. I didn't come from an academic family. I'd, I assumed that pro professors were sort of grown in fields. You know, they, they just kind of emerged from pods. I had no idea what went into the making of a professor. So I didn't even know what graduate school was. So he said, graduate school is what you do when you want to be a college professor. I said, yeah, I, did. I was shocked to learn that one could do this. Uh, so I began thinking about it, and I thought, well, if this means I can extend my schooling a few more years, that seemed that seemed something worth doing. Uh, yeah. So I do credit uh, that professor um, who became a, a very dear, close friend uh, and someone whose memory I deeply cherish. And, and um, I've actually uh, edited, co-edited two books of his writings uh, with his daughter, who's now also a political uh, theorist, uh, Susan McWilliams. Gosh. So. Uh, so yeah, I mean th those kinds of um, encounters are, you know, surprising, unexpected, unpredictable, and transformative. And again, relational, right? The stories yes. of our lives are uh, as about the people that we meet, that we learn to trust, as mm -hmm. about the ideas that we encounter, that we feel are persuasive. Those things are indivisible. Now you are a university professor. You know, you've published many books. You sit in a very significant ac academic institution. How much do you think of that role as a vocation? How much do you, what are you trying to do with your voice? What do you think an academic um, can contribute to the common good, to a common life? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I guess it's taken me uh, a number of years to figure out exactly what what being a, what I think being a professor is uh, again when I first uh, was first told about the that, that this was a possible profession my main interest was I can keep reading books uh, and thinking ideas um, and um, talking about interesting things and then as I you know get in you, when you start as a professor and I was very I was very blessed I had uh, a, really a series of remarkable positions my First job was at Princeton University, uh, which you know kind of plucked me out of complete obscurity. Uh, 
uh, into a pretty prominent, obviously a prominent institution. But there, the only thing you're mainly concerned about is doing research and trying to get tenure. And that was kind of the single-minded focus uh, of my first six, seven years of, of teaching. But as I began to kind of get my head over the the parapet, uh, it's not that I got tenure at Princeton, I didn't. I was tenured at uh, Georgetown University, my, my second position. But even when I was at Princeton and I began thinking about what do I want to do once, you know, assuming someday I get tenure somewhere, I did really begin to think about it much more in terms of vocation. Uh, and one of the things I noticed was the my own unhappiness, or I was able to interpret and understand my own unhappiness with the model of the life of a professor as it was being, um, you know, as it's internalized as, as someone who, especially in a kind of really, you know, kind of intense, pressure-filled, highly ranked, prestigious institution like Princeton. And the dominant, the dominant concern becomes research productivity. It becomes um, production of new knowledge. And by new knowledge, uh, the model is the natural sciences. So that uh, the way in which the natural sciences proceed is that small incremental advances of knowledge are made always by just kind of slightly examining or slightly changing the terms of the, the experiment and coming up with a kind of new way of understanding the phenomenon that you're studying. So it's a kind of, um, again, a slow sedimentation of advances of knowledge. And this model, which was you know, is dominant. It's the dominant model of the way in which we understand academia unfolding. Seemed to me to be fundamentally at odds with what the purpose of my discipline was, and of the broader disciplines that I was most interested in. Which, as I mentioned, were uh, was first literary, was uh, was literature in my undergraduate studies became more philosophical literature. So my dissertation was written on the Odyssey, uh, Homer's Odyssey, and the way in which it could be read as a kind of text of political philosophy. Um, and the way in which this philosophical and literary tradition intersected with politics, that is to say, the social political environment, what it is we are as human beings and the kind of societies that we build. And here, it seemed to me that the, the model of kind of progress and the progressive knowledge, a progressive advance of knowledge was a, was a problem. It was a problematic model because what it tended to do was to discount that which had preceded us. So that, you know, we don't read, we don't read old science textbooks because that understanding has been superseded, right? I mean, so if you, if you follow the textbook trades, textbooks are updated every year, every couple of years, right? You don't read the old, we don't read psychology texts from 2010, much less 1960, much less, you know, 1900 or 1800. But I read texts that are ancient and I learn from texts that are ancient and I teach texts that are ancient. And so what increasingly struck me was that the academic model, all of the incentives and the reward system, that the, the system of evaluation by which you receive um, first a doctorate and then a posi an academic position and then tenure and then promotion and endowed chairs and so forth, its premise was fundamentally contradictory to what I thought I was doing as an academic or as a professor. And moreover, this approach makes one, as a faculty member, makes one much less likely to be interested in teaching undergraduates because they're learning your, your field at the very beginning stages. But as an academic, as an expert, as someone who's trying to advance the frontiers of knowledge, you're much more interested, at least in theory, in the much more advanced, much more specialized, much more specific forms of knowledge than someone who's 18 to 22 years old. And I've, I've never forgotten my 18 to 22 year old self in the sense that, you know, I, I'm deeply grateful for that teacher that I mentioned who helped me to realize the importance of front porches and, the, and my township of New England in my own formation. So I'm sorry, this is a long, it's a long answer, but um, it, 
I think my vocation as a professor in some ways runs contrary to the entire, more or less, the structure of academia today. And so I've always felt myself as a bit of a kind of outsider to the ethos of the modern university. But I think that's also given me a little bit of a critical edge um, on what the university is and has allowed me um, to, to see it a little bit from the outside, to see it you know, a little bit like, um, you know, like a, a, a foreigner um, visiting a new country and mm. seeing things that aren't otherwise visible to people who are there all the time. So I, so I think that that um, has actually helped me in terms of the kinds of work that I've undertaken and the kinds of things that I've written, certainly in, in recent years. Mm. And throughout this time when you're kind of climbing the ladder, from, from my understanding, please correct me if I'm kind of narrating this wrong, there is this kind of deepening clarification of your own political philosophy from, I think, a short time, at least in the orbit of the Democratic Party, writing for someone who had been appointed by Clinton, is that right? And then this kind of Catholic reconversion and the increasing sense of relationality and reading to Tocqueville. And then you come really burst into the public eye outside academia with why liberalism failed. And could you just, it's a horrible thing to ask an author to do, but could you just sum up the argument of that um, in a couple of lines for us? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the that book um, was published in 2018, uh, but it was, in many ways it was written uh, it was written slowly then fast, right? So, as I think, as I say, it happened slowly and then quickly. Uh, it was um, the culmination of about a decade of work um, that was more in the world of blogs and um, lectures, lectures especially to undergraduates. Uh, so much of the much of the bones of that book was written in about a decade before the publication. Um, so, yeah, roughly. Around the time that I had started at Georgetown, which would have been 2012, maybe earlier than that, 2009, 2008, um, I was writing for a blog called Front Porch Republic. Um, I was um, that that I helped to found, um, and and doing quite a bit of lecturing to undergraduates. So that that was the kind of background. So in other words, the audience I was thinking about for that work was not an academic audience or not a narrowly academic audience. It was really, that work was really directed at, yes, I, when I thought about my audience, it was my smartest undergraduates, <clears throat> the kind of undergraduate that would pick up a nonfiction book as something fun to do. <laughs> as, as something, you know, the kind of, uh, you know, the, the version of myself um, trying to figure out why Ayn Rand didn't like Plato and Aristotle. That, that was my target audience, which is small, but not, not uh, turns out not insignificant. <clears throat> uh, the book itself was, um, you know, I think as I've already foreshadowed, was an effort to distill what I thought was wrong with a lot of the modern world um, that had arisen, or my argument was that it had arisen or resulted from a set of um, philosophical arguments that became realized in our political, social, economic order. Uh, and essentially, the, you know, it's a critique. Uh, the book is called Why, Why Liberalism Failed. And it's a critique of not, not just liberal philosophy, but the way in which liberal philosophy becomes realized. So I'll just, I'll just say, again, in, in the briefest way, uh, in, in the in, in the first articulation, the earliest articulation of liberal philosophy, there's an argument that human beings, we can understand what true human nature is if we look at human beings in, in what comes to be known as the state of nature. So if we can see it, or if we can distill the essence of human beings, we would, we would imagine them in a world without politics, in a world without even society, a world where in a sense, relationality doesn't even exist. We're kind of autonomous wholes, um, entire selves that that pursue our own ends and our own good. Uh, and this condition is described as one in which we are all completely free and completely equal. This is a condition of freedom and uh, radical freedom and radical equality. Uh, so there's no real differentiation between us. We'd all just do our own thing. And um, the great French political theorist Bertrand de Juvenel, uh, 
uh, once once uh, summarized this way of thinking as uh, this, these were all the writings of childless men who had forgotten their own childhood, uh, which I, I think is a really a perfect, oh, the, a perfect the, summary. The, Astute feminist critique in there is making me very yeah. happy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it is. I mean, it's a. But here's the thing. I mean, anyone who reads this recognizes it's a fiction. Um, but what strikes me is that if again, I'm I'm trained in social sciences, even though I'm a political philosopher. One of the kind of continuous and stunning findings, ongoing findings of the social sciences is that the world that we have created is more and more like the state of nature uh, than um, the world that preceded it. That, that if we look at what are some of the distinctive features of human beings today, we are more and more alone. We are more and more on our own. We are less and less likely to be those relational creatures we begin by talking about. We have fewer and fewer relationships. We're less likely... Uh, to get married or to have children. We're less likely to have siblings than previous generations or cousins. Uh, we are. Um, we have fewer friends today than a generation ago, uh, than people did a generation ago. And we have fewer close friends than people did a, a generation ago. The, the, the Surgeon General of the United States just last week or two weeks ago issued a report on the crisis of loneliness in America that it's a it's a now a kind of considered to be according to our government a, a kind of national crisis a disease uh, that needs to be treated and so what's striking about this is that the the theory of the state of nature which anyone who thinks about it for a moment recognizes how absurd it is has actually been realized not because it's our nature, but by this kind of apparatus, by this massive structure of the modern world that in the, in the aspiration to make ourselves into that creature, we've created these massive structures of politics and government and society and education. Technology. Yeah, an economy and so forth. Um, down into the deepest, most private places that we tend to think of are not political, but which, of course, are always shaped by the, <clears throat> the political order we're in. Uh, and and it's, it was viewing the kind of ongoing accumulation of this kind of data uh, over, you know, more than a decade that I, that I wrote this book um, saying, essentially saying that liberalism, liberalism failed because liberalism has succeeded. Yes. Do you call yourself a communitarian? Um, I, I've been, I suppose I've been sometimes called that by others. I don't know that I've ever called myself that, but it was certainly uh, in the air uh, when I was in uh, both undergraduate and graduate school. It was one of the main debates was communitarianism versus liberalism. But it, it struck me that communitarians at some level were almost always liberals. They wanted kind of liberalism to be sprinkled or, um, you know, just sort of given a little bit of a, a patina of, of, of a kind of community. But the communitarians of us, at least of an earlier generation, were really terrified to sort of you know, make a, a kind of much more comprehensive critique of the liberal order. Um, and I think maybe one difference between, I would say, myself and I think a growing number of people who are critics of liberalism is that that in-between place is no longer seen as viable. Mm. And could, your new book is called Regime Change Towards a Post-Liberal Future, and it's obviously kind of building on, okay, if, what, if liberalism has failed, what needs to come next? How do you define post-liberalism? Well, so at, at one level, post-liberalism is, is pre-liberalism in the sense that it takes, especially from the teachings of, I've mentioned the name Aquinas, oh, so, sorry, Aristotle. I'll, I'll get to Aquinas in a second. Uh, um, it takes from a kind of Aristotelian understanding. Uh, and maybe at the most basic level, Aristotle writes the the statement that's ultimately overturned, or the, at least the attempt to overturn. Uh, it's attempted to be overturned by liberal thinkers and liberal political thought. Uh, 
And the, the sentence is, man is by nature a political animal. So that's like one of the, the core sort of just statements, declarative statements by Aristotle in his book called The Politics. And whenever I uh, teach that text and I teach that sentence even, it turns out it's a really, it's a difficult teaching. It's not as obvious. It's like a lot of Aristotle. It sounds obvious. Man is by nature a political animal. But it's not obvious because... Aristotle at the same time recognizes that politics at some level is conventional. The way in which we organize our society can take a lot of different forms. In this sense, it's conventional. It's, it can be, it can alter, and it can be altered according to time and place, various particular traditions, various conditions, various kinds of judgments, circumstance, happenstance, coincidence. Um, a lot of factors go into this. Um, sometimes I compare it to table manners. Uh, there are lots of different ways, or the way in which we eat, lots of different ways in which we can arrange our the, sort of the manners that accompany uh, dining. You know, from the you know somewhat familiar when I go to Europe. I see forks and knives. I just notice Europeans don't switch hands like Americans do. You know, so which they consider themselves much more civilized. Americans consider themselves maybe. I'm not sure if we consider ourselves more civilized, but Miss Manners said the more com complicated it is, obviously, the more civilized it is. So she said Americans could be could make a claim to being more civilized. But then you get outside of the U.S. and you have lots of different ways in which you know you can have chopsticks or you can have. Um, yeah, just lots of different kinds of implements used uh, to consume food. And you, you could take this analogy and say, for Aristotle, this is like politics. Politics is, on the one hand, it's conventional. It can take lots of different forms. You can have a democracy, you can have aristocracy, you can have monarchy. On the other hand, we all have to eat if we're going to stay alive. And so politics is natural in the following way. It's, it, it's, it's the in some ways, a kind of fundamental aspect of our what it is to be a human. Without politics, we're not fully human. If we could imagine ourselves outside of a political city, it wouldn't be like Locke and Hobbes, where we're kind of rational agents that can make dis, you know kind of rational decisions about ourselves. We would not be recognizably human. Uh, and it's only through politics that we can become human. But the but at, having said that. There are lots of ways in which we can organize our politics that make it also conventional. So it's natural for us to be conventional creatures. And one of the ways in which liberalism makes it difficult for us to understand that, that is that liberalism tends to make us uh, or tends to create a division between the natural and the oh, what, what we sometimes divide the world between nature, nature and nurture. There's the natural and there's that which is nurtured. And Aristotle says, look, it's, it's natural to be nurtured. It's natural for us to be developed. We're creatures that achieve our the fullness of our being in and through nurture. And so the question always becomes, what's the form of nurturing that needs to take place for our nature to be fully realized? And that's the, that's the Aristotelian argument. Um, <clears throat> so I've gone down, down a rabbit hole now, but I think that's, that's, the, but that's the, the, that's the, um, the, the kind of essence or the origin of the alternative way of thinking about politics. And that really is the kind of leaping off point. Yeah. It feels to me just a kind of a critique of this idea that the freedom of the individual is the highest or indeed only good that a state or a culture should pursue because we are so inherently relational. And your book really doesn't fit into kind of existing, not existing, but the kind of most commonly known um, tribes or structures, you know, you're, it's, you, you're referencing solidarity, you're talking about integration, you have this sense of the kind of mixed constitution, which is really about people mixing in that same way that you did in your small town, that we should know our neighbours and we need to rework our institutions to stop this funneling of two classes, really, a managerial class and I guess what used to be called the working class. It's difference is such a theme in your work, but it doesn't seem to have been th that I think you see what you are already thinking, right? And I, I am obsessed with difference and divides and how we 
retain our ability to see each other as fully human across tribes, how we retain a fundamental commitment to the dignity of the other, even when they might be saying things with which we vociferously disagree. And so I wanted to ask you about how your tone and your positioning, because your proposed liberal proposal is so driven from my reading by wanting to avert what you call a cold civil war. You know, there's just the, the, the drifting further and further apart of liberals and conservatives and to kind of bring people back together, force them into relationship with each other because that's how we're fully human. But as you navigate the public discussion, it's so interesting reading about you because your, your persona in person, and I've met you and, and read about you, is very calm and thoughtful. Um, and yet the way people think of, talk about your ideas elsewhere is of, you know, a big, bad culture war warrior. Someone, someone, someone described you as red pill for boomers, which was quite a phrase. And I, yeah. I can sense this two, these two parts of yourself that we all have of wanting to listen and engage and understand with the liberals that you disagree with but also sometimes sounding very angry and very urgent about what's gone wrong with liberalism and the way you think it's harmed people. I'm sorry, that's a very incoherent question, but as you're trying to work out how your own voice and your own ideas either help heal or help create divides, where are you on that? Mm -hmm. Let's think about that together. <laughs> sure. Well, you know, actually, your question reminds me of a conversation I had with a really wonderful student um, who just graduated, who spent the last few years on campus attempting to create various fora and student groups where people could come together and talk about ways they could overcome division. And I said to her, this is a wonderful effort, um, at, but at the end of the day, there are probably just some things you're just going to disagree about. They're just certain things that people, you know, they, 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 you're touching on their core beliefs and you have to recognize that you're going to be, you're going to be opponents politically. Uh, and that's just, that's just the truth. I think sometimes that those who are committed to overcoming difference or at least re continuing to see the humanity of the person who opposes them, uh, that that has to be a recognition. And in some ways, I think Maybe it's coming to that recognition that maybe still allows us to see the humanity of the other person. It's not just that we're going to, that that humanity requires us to, we're going to all agree and get along. That the reality of our humanity is that, well, as I said earlier, I'm not sure if it's that, you know, the world's divided between people who liked their upbringing, people who, who wanted to get away from their upbringing. But for whatever reason, we do have these really fundamentally different ways of seeing the world. And depending on kind of who runs the show, that vision is going to be realized. And this is why politics is, you know, it's 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 hand to hand combat at some level. Um, it's it's uh, uh, it's not just about tribes. I think that's the way it's sometimes talked about. That's that's too irrational at some level. It's about who gets to advance and instantiate a kind of worldview. And that's going to have repercussions. It's going to have consequences in the real world. It's going to shape how people's lives unfold. And some people are going to be likely to benefit from that. And some people are likely not to benefit from that. And that's the reality. And sometimes when we speak about politics, people will pose their questions or their views as if they're coming from a place where I stand from a position where there will be no repercussions, no negative consequences or effects. But politics is always going to be the realm of the imperfect, of the, um, you know, certain choices will be advanced or certain preferences will be advanced and certain others will not be. Mm. Can this be done in a way um, in which you retain or build on the recognition of other human beings? And this is, to get back, get back to your first earlier question, this is what, what I hope, what I certainly think post-liberalism is, which is that, it takes that kernel of understanding from the pre-liberal tradition that I mentioned of Aristotle or in, in the writings of Aquinas, who adds that man is by nature a social and political animal. But it's post-liberal. And it takes from, the, in some ways, the achievements that I see as um, having 
having its roots in a Christian understanding of the human person, but has been advanced in the liberal order as the recognition of the dignity of every human being, regardless of one's gender, one's sexual orientation, one's, you know, however we define ourselves, one, one's religion. Can one, without becoming a liberal, can one retain that respect for other human beings while combining that or realizing that through and in an Aristotelian idea of relationality? And the way in which this divide is today, or the way in which the, our politics tends to be posed, is one can have either or. And I think a post-liberalism is in some ways trying to move beyond that divide. Mm. Trying to move beyond that divide. It's a real tension, isn't it? You use it this is. phrase, possibly using Machiavelli Machia blah, Machiavellian means for mm. Aristotelian ends. And I think you're what your book left me with was, because I, as regular listeners will know, my sacred value is also relationships and relationality for the same Trinitarian-influenced reasons. M much of the proposals that you're putting forth, and I'm much more comfortable with calling myself communitarian, I feel very convinced by. The bit that I worry about is whether you can ever... I don't think means and ends are so divisible. And I think that... You know, the, it's the Marshall McLuhan thing. I think the way we go about offering ideas into the world is as important as the ideas that we're offering. And I see it both. So my friends on the left who, for example, are around environmentalism or around trans rights would say, yeah, 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 dialogue, very nice, but people are dying. It's more important that we win. And my friends on the right around pro-life issues in particular will say the exact same thing. You know, very nice, but they're wrong and we're right. And the important thing is that we win. And I am losing faith in that whole theory of change. <laughs> because if we're seeking the common good, which is something that you're talking about a lot, a common good in which we can all live, then the way we can pour ourselves is vital and it feels like that's one of the things we've lost and maybe you maybe you would say we've lost it because of liberalism and because of this separation and because of the primacy of the individual rather than our sense of our deep interconnectedness i'm sorry that is not a question but i would be interested in your thoughts mm. well i guess let me, let me take a step back which is to address the my obviously <clears throat> intentionally provocative phrase in an intentionally provocatively titled book. Yes, the title is provocative. It is, and, and probably the people will be disappointed uh, since the book is not nearly as... Uh, it's really the, not. <laughs> no, no. I mean, it is it is it is about a regime change, and in some ways it's more... Um, but not a violent one. <laughs> no, and it's, it's it's not what people think. So it's not a, a sort of, yeah, a violent overthrow of the government. It's a fundamentally different way of seeing what politics is and that in that way it's a much more kind of revolutionary appeal than merely overthrowing a government that would be just you know just replacing one group of bad people with another group of bad people but but um um but the the phrase machiavellian means to aristotelian ends what I was really, what I'm really appealing to there, and, and you know, you've, if you've read this, you, you, you're aware of this. Ma, so the, the step back, a step back from a step back. So the book is really an argument about the nature of, in particular, why that we we have a kind of particular form of a leadership class in the modern world, this liberal leadership class. And the argument of the book is that this leadership class is is and is shaped by, and its 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 purposes are to advance a liberal order, as as my last book was de describing and laying out. And a consequence of this is that it actually is premised on the rejection of the classical idea of mixed constitution or mixed government, uh, which in its classical formulation, seeks to kind of achieve a kind of a balance or even a blending between the ruling class and those who are ruled. Mm. 
kind of a, a kind of um, either a balance or an outright mixing. So there's two senses of mixing going on. There's the kind of mixing of the mixed salad in which all the elements are still identifiable. And then there's the mixing of the smoothie in which everything kind of, you know, you can't really distinguish the, the, the particular tastes from one another. Machiavelli argues that the form of mixed constitution that is really only achievable, uh, that creates a kind of working political order, is the kind of mixed salad model. And in particular, the power of the many is utilized to restrain the power of the few. The power of the few, we could say the ruling class, the elites, which exist in every society, always tends to be, they have the kind of concentration of resources, um, they have wealth, they have influence, they control institutions. They don't have a lot of people, but what they have is a lot of the kind of instruments of power. What the people have is numbers. And so what Machiavelli argues is that Rome in particular was able to achieve a kind of mixed constitution by the rabble kind of using their numerical superiority to extract concessions and demand a limitation on the, on the advance and use of power by the elites. And this, this is the kind of Machiavellian means that I mean. Okay. Uh, but Aristotelian ends is more the image of the smoothie. Um, it's more a kind of mixing of the classes that moves away from the idea that it's simply a clash or it's simply a kind of um, almost a, a, a kind of ongoing continual conflict. And so the argument, that argument of that, um, you know, the book as a whole and of that chapter that you're appealing to or discussing in particular is that at the moment, in my view, this is something I think a lot of people would disagree with, but in my view at the moment, I think that there's a way in which there's a kind of a, a domination by elites of the, the many, of the kind of working class, of the lower classes, of a kind of multiracial, non-liberal, non-successful kind of citizenry, uh, who are largely regarded as having, you know, through, through their own fault and their own bad choices, not succeeded in this open, inviting, increasingly borderless, boundaryless world. And I think that, that the only way in some ways to um, force this ruling class to recognize what they are, what their approach and policies are wreaking on everyday people is through a kind of political pushback. And I think that is kind of what's happening in our world today. I think that, de that defines the political divide that we're seeing. And if we don't, as you said, if we don't want to see this go the direction of a cold or even a hot civil war, the happy outcome of this, in my view, would be Aristotelian ends. But the Aristotelian ends are likely only to be achieved through at least th through first steps of being a kind of Machiavellian means of a kind of assertion of political power. So I don't know here whether you know, the ends, the ends um, are contrary to the means, um, but I actually think that there's a kind of continuity here that um, without sort of a kind of forceful political pushback, um, there's not likely to be a willingness to achieve the kind of blending uh, that, I'm, that I call for at, in the last chapter of the book, uh, the, the chapter on integration. Mm. Much food for thought there. Well, Patrick Deneen, I really had to engage my, uh, really had to engage my ideas brain for this one as we uh, dotted around between Plato and Aristotle and Ayn Rand. Um, but we started, before we get into any of that, with his sacred value of relationships and, um, what did he put it like that? Sacred value of the Trinity. Uh, I may have been projecting because it's very close to my own sacred value. It might be the first time that a guest has said something so close um, to my understanding, which is interesting to me. Um, but yes, because of his sense that the 
God as Trinity is so key to how humans being flourish, how human beings flourish, that we are made for relationships. Um, relationships is what has has driven his work, which, as we'll come back to, I think relates very interesting about um, humanitarianism or community mindedness or kind of a, a hostility to individualism and how that does and doesn't come through. He made me laugh by saying there's two kinds of people in the world, those who think that there are two kinds of people in the world and those who don't. Um, and then going on to talk about the two kinds of people, which uh, was very kind of pleasingly self-aware at how much we want to reach for these binaries and that they're helpful, but also ridiculous. But I do think there's something in that sense of the legacy of our childhoods and how much it's not that we necessarily want to recreate them, but maybe we want to hold on to the treasures of them. Um, and for those of us whose childhoods didn't feel like they left a particularly life-giving or liberatory legacy. Um, and I wonder how that plays out across political parties, across temperaments, across uh, different parts of different philosophies and religions. And it made me think about nostalgia because he talks about, one of his projects was called something like the Front Porch Review or something. This idea of front porches, the idea that you have a community that is walkable and there are enough um, built into the very town planning. There is enough points of repeated accidental overlap in a community that you know your neighbours, that someone will wave for you, wave at you from their front porch. They will, they will be sitting on the front porch, not out in the garden where you can't see them, which I think is what it tends to be in the UK. Um, but that somehow designing communities and designing our lives to force us into repeated uh, casual overlap with each other. I remember when I was working at the BBC, they redesigned the offices in Media City and there was all this chat about where they put the toilets to force people to walk past each other. Um, it feels like left to ourselves as humans, we might naturally withdraw into our little castles. And one of the ways we can think about the common good and our common life is how do you create accidental um, our friction, and I don't necessarily mean friction as a bad word, actually, I think in our, in the in community in which we live, we talk about frictionful, not frictionless. Um, the frictionless world of tech is one of the things that I think is possibly not forming us in particularly helpful ways. But yeah, it got me thinking about nostalgia because in some ways you could hear him talking about his, his hometown with the front porches and it was all walkable. It's like lovely, lovely, but isn't that just nostalgic? And I think nos nostalgia means homesickness. And it really interests me, this, this sense, and again, it's coming up again and again, this series, the, like, the, the, the hunger in the human brain to find binaries, you know, to find either ors. Like either we hold to the past and the legacy of our ancestors and we conserve what we have received or we're, you know, we are conservatives or we are progressives and we are focused on the future and we're moving forward, you know, we're basically dumping the past, we're moving forward. And how it surely must be possible, it must be possible to be, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's an old cliche, but I'm thinking of the roots and the shoots, to be, to take what nostalgia is telling us, to listen for what is the good that we want to protect and cherish, but also be wanting to grow and move forward um, and to do that carefully um, and with discernment about maybe what we don't want to carry into the future with us. I'm wondering what it would be to be someone who could, do I mean backward facing and forward facing? That sounds two faced, literally. Yeah, what, what is a posture? towards the past and the future. And I'm sure someone's going to say, it's just being in the present. Uh, the present is all we have, but I don't know, that doesn't come easy to me. I think we do need to think about the past and we do need to imagine the future. Um, and we have a tendency to, to think one is more important than the other and to be temperamentally inclined to one more than the other. Um, and then to draw tribal lines around that. Similarly with new knowledge and old knowledge, right? It's like the academy is all about new knowledge, and he wants to protect the old knowledge. It's got to be both. Maybe I'm just a woolly fence sitter. This this conversation clarified me that clarified for me at least in his definition that I think liberalism just is indiv just is individualism. That it is the kind of liberating the individual from 
undue constraints of others, which is obviously a powerfully good thing if you are living under illegitimate constraints, um, as many people and groups have. But his definition of liberalism, which I should have got him to say in this because uh, lots of these terms are slippery, confusing, but his definition was um, from the early thinkers that was basically being able to, I think he said, dispose of your, your person and your possessions as you see fit is the definition of that kind of freedom that liberation is, uh, liberalism is moving towards. Um, And in its very refusal to take into account or center at least the fact that as well as being individuals, we are persons and persons in relationship and shaped and formed by others and um, irreconcilably and unavoidably influential brushing up, frictionful with each other, um, that it somehow doesn't tell the whole story of what human beings are like and how they flourish. That's what I'm hearing from him. I'm so interested that he doesn't want to call himself a communitarian. It feels like that's the definition of post-liberalism to me, that it is um, saying families matter, institutions matter, sites of belonging matter, places that we can grow, you know, communities of moral formation matter. And by putting the full weight of ethics, really, on just the individual. We've forgotten that, and we have therefore eroded all these places where we become more fully human. Um, I don't know if communitarianism's got sort of hippy-dippy baggage that he doesn't like, um, but I wonder what alternative language is about that. And I have to say, I do, like, getting hold of what he means by post-liberalism, I found quite a bit tricky and I think it's probably because it's quite political theory language which is not my mother tongue um but yes I think it's it's the real challenge for someone like Patrick when you're trying to offer something that is not an established script is the ability for those of us slightly outside to get hold of it is really difficult he did a great interview with Ezra Klein um last year and there was this sense of, of some level of frustration of like but what do we act, what does it mean? What do we actually want to do? And actually, I remember thinking Patrick was came across as very towards the end of that podcast, he came across really humble because he was like, policy's not my thing, Ezra, that's your thing. I'm trying to say these are the values by which we should be orienting our common life. Um But yeah, I think I came away thinking I thought I thought I knew what post-liberalism was. And now I'm not as I'm not as sure what it means to set up our society in ways that are not liberal, but neither fall into a kind of authoritarianism or a just a sort of tyranny of the majority that um, I don't think Patrick is proposing either. And perhaps the most interesting thing for me was this thing at the end where I tried to really gently challenge him about tone and posture. And I've been thinking a lot about that Patrick Deneen and Jared, uh, Jared Sexton, who I had on the previous uh, series who in some ways is like um, Patrick's photo negative, you know, quite, when I was researching them, quite combative political operator or at least political commentators, strong opinions. And both of them actually in other places, I'd heard them really talking about their opponent with like dripping with contempt and anger. But in person and in long form and in my conversations with them, I just thoughtful and nuanced and careful. And so what is it, that temptation? Is it just that's the air of these conversations? Is it that that's the norm? Is it this sense that you get more listeners, you get more eyeballs, that angrier, more withering and more contemptuous that you are? Or is some of that needed? And, you know, Patrick's thing about politics is basically hand-to-hand combat and the stakes are high. And so fluffy people like me who want to listen across the divides are like nice to have, but also not really uh, focused on the real job in hand. You know, maybe we're a bit naive. And I really want to hear that challenge. I don't want to just be creating extra noise in the world. Maybe if there's battles to fight, I should be in the trenches fighting them if I could decide what the right ones were. Um... But actually, I talked about it with with my producer afterwards, 
And I, I don't believe that politics has to be hand-to-hand combat. I do believe that it is possible for human beings to collaborate across our differences to build a common life, but it takes an extraordinary level of emotional intelligence and kind of moral courage and ego loss, really, to approach contributing to our common life in a way that is not such a binary us, them, we need to win and they need to lose. But the people who've made the, done the most good and made the most difference in the world have those things. They have that moral courage. They have that capacity to hold space for difference. And also on a more explicitly theological note from my tradition and my language, the the clearest command I can find in scripture for how we're supposed to engage in public is love your neighbor and love your enemy. Like there's no explicit command to win a battle, whether it's to create justice for immigrants, whether it's to oppose abortion, you know, whether it's to fight for the environment. I think you can probably, you know, you can read, there's many ways to read scripture, but you can, there's ways to get to those things as a command if you're a Christian. But the like plain text off the page reading, just love your enemies, love them. Seek their good. If they smack you in the face, offer them your other cheek. If they take your coat, offer them your other coat. You know, the posture of, what is it? It's, a, it? it's that phrase that came up in the Do Good interviews of engaged surrender. Is that relevant here? Anyway, I'm thinking a lot about what's naivety in politics and public life and what is possible, um, what is possible across our difference. Is am I, is it possible to really listen, to really hear, to really see, to really treat each other with dignity and to be trying to bring about the kind of justice that is informed by our vision of the good and our values, whatever they may be. To be continued. To be continued.